Hi, good evening. Welcome to Fermi Lab. Ready for the physics slam? Everybody's pumped for that. Right? Okay. You're not, not, I'm not. I'm not the guy to applaud for. Hang in there for a second. Okay, so I'd like to tell you about uh, some upcoming events we have on uh, Friday, January 16th. Uh, guitarist, author, Fermi Lab theorist, and all around great guy, Dan Hooper's going to give us a talk on uh, revealing the nature of dark matter. Coming up uh, next month for our Christmas show, Reduced Shakespeare is going to give us uh, the ultimate Christmas show. That's the actual title of the show, but it's going to be that good. It's going to be ultimate Christmas show. So here we go to start it off direct from his long-standing two-night engagement at Alfie's Hamburger Stand in downtown Glen Ellen, the host of the Shakespeare show, College of Pages, Chris Miller. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Chris Miller. I'm a professor of speech communication at College of DuPage. This is my uh, third time doing the, uh, the physics slam here at Fermi Lab. It's absolutely crazy. Um, you know, the first two times I did this, the, the first year I actually did the, the physics slam, um, I had never been to Fermi Lab before. I mean, I'm a, I'm a speech communication major, so uh, when they asked me to do physics slam, <laughs> I thought, uh, I don't think I can do physics slam. Um, but I'm here, and it was pretty good the first time. And it was, it was shocking to me the first year I did physics slam, and then even more so the second year by the amount of people under the age of 18 that were here. Absolutely shocked by it. And, and I want to just highlight that again before we even start tonight. So, because what I understand, 150, I mean, there's a, you can look around. This is fairly full for, for a Friday night to watch, you know, physics. Um, but, <laughs> um, but 150 of them are students. So, if you are a person under the age of 18, would you, actually, I don't want you to applaud at all. I want people that are over the age of 18 to applaud for you for being here tonight. So, go and please do that. You know, and I ask you to do that because, you know, I, I teach college, and even today, it was interesting, my students in my classes right now are finishing their informative presentations, and um, sometimes I hear speeches on uh, how to make Ugg boots, which, yeah, it's, it's thrilling, um, or, uh, you know, how to make, you know, snacks, that kind of stuff, and then I come here and I get to watch these five brilliant physicists talk about you know, neutrinos and the end of the universe, right? And I think to myself, wow, how incredible would it be if more younger people were interested in sort of real life events, things that really impact our lives. And I just think it's absolutely fantastic that so many young people on a Friday night are willing to come out with each other and with their parents to watch science, to watch physics. I think it's beautiful, actually. And I, and I applaud you for coming out here and doing that and supporting this, but to this, this, this slam, um, because you're going to just see some amazing things. And I'm just hoping for the future of, well, of Illinois. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, Illinois, I got to move. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, or, but even just the United States of America, I just, I thank you for coming out and, 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 and uh, I mean, it makes me emotional to just have you to watch physics. You know, it's, as an educator, it's just great. I mean, all the things you could do on a Friday night, you decide to come out and watch this. You should be proud of yourselves. You should look at yourself tonight in the mirror. You should just smile because you're expanding your minds. You're expanding your souls and you're, and ultimately you're, I mean, if you watch what these people do and if you, I mean, one day you can actually be on this particular stage doing the same thing. And, uh, and I just think it's great. Um, out of the 150 students though that are here tonight that bought tickets, from what I understand, 75 of you are from Mar Marion Academy. Am I saying that correct? Mar Marmion, I'm sorry. You know what sucks about this? I worked on that backstage and you should ask all the people around here. I did. I mean, then I, I just go murmuring, and I just did that, right? Marmion Academy. If you're here from Marmion Academy. <laughs> it makes me more mad. They said some of you are in uniform, and I was like, the guys look like they're in the Army? Oh, God. <laughs> and if I mess this up, I'm going to, don't beat me up. Look, I'm just an old 41-year-old bald man that's trying. 
Anyway, I do want to highlight one individual that's over here, right? Last year at our second annual Physics Slam. But who was here last year for the second annual Physics Slam? If you were here last year, you saw a gentleman that had a lot of hair that today has no hair. But he actually wanted to, he was so excited about being in it last year and he wanted to come here today. So he came by to say hi to me and he decided to sit down and watch this Physics Slam today together. So everybody, last year's winner over there, Dr. Brian Nord. Please, Brian Nord, please stand up. Hopefully we can do justice for him tonight and for all of you. So that's all I have to say. Here are some of the rules tonight. We have five speakers that are going to be talking to you about physics, things that they're interested in, some of their research, and they're going to put it to you in a 10-minute presentation. Now, these 10-minute presentations, they're not, well, we ask them to go under 10 minutes, right? We're going to be judging them at the end of today's slam, at the end of the five of them, by, by the, the loudness, right, of your applause. So if they go over 10 minutes, they're not disqualified, but it should go against them, unless you just think it's amazing. Like, I don't care about time. I don't care about time. <laughs> the Earth doesn't care about time. <laughs> you know, physics. Um, but uh, they're supposed to be under 10 minutes. And they were all under 10 minutes today, so hopefully they'll be under 10 minutes again, right? So watch them. We'll be ju at the end of all five of them, we'll bring them all out together. I will mention their names one more time. I'll give you five seconds to applaud as loud as you can. Yell if you want to do it, whatever you want. And at the end of that, our judges will decide who had the loudest applause, and we will be giving them some kind of prize, and I'm sure it is. I don't know, keys to Fermilab, I'm sure they have that. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask Dr. Nigel Lockyer later on what he did. Um, but here's the whole point about it. So that's what the rules are. That's the only rules, too, right? Ten minutes, uh, and then you just sit back and enjoy. So I'm going to start this thing off with our first presenter of the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage Dr. Michael Hildreth. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Mike. <laughs> Data is fundamental. It's the base currency of all science. That being said, we are currently awash in a rising flood of digital data. Some people have called this the data tsunami. This is the data tsunami. This is you. <laughs> the purpose of my talk this evening is to tell you something about sci what scientists are doing right now to design data preservers to keep you and your data afloat in this flood. So before I do that, I have to start to talk a little bit about the language of data. The fundamental unit of data is a bit. That's an individual zero or one. If I take a collection of bits, you can see that I can form all kinds of different patterns. Eight bits is a byte. And you can use these data to code for letters and numbers. In particular, these eight bits code for the letter M. So now if you look down this list of familiar digital objects, you can see that their sizes get bigger and bigger and bigger. In particular, take a look at the Library of Congress here. The full print plus digital holdings of the Library of Congress are about a petabyte. Now, this is something that I can wrap my mind around because it's, well, a, a standard hard drive these days is about a terabyte, so that's about a thousand hard drives. You can kind of stack them up, that makes sense. When I start to contemplate the outrageously large data sets that we're actually currently producing, basically my mind explodes and I have to go and do something else. Okay. But it's true that big data is big, and so I've compiled some statistics here. I don't really have time to go through all of these, but here are some of my favorites. Every two days, there are 750 million photos uploaded to Facebook. Here are some of mine. <laughs> Each day, the number of text messages sent and received exceeds the population of the planet. And perhaps my favorite, there are almost as many bits, almost as many bits, of the information in the digital universe as there are stars in our universe. And there are a lot of stars. OK, so we can display the exponential growth of, of big data in a number of different ways. Here's something that shows from 2010 to 2015 to projected 2020, the huge growth of data that's being produced worldwide. So we're going to end up with something like 35 zettabytes, which is just unbelievably huge, of data in 2020. And so now this is all the data produced, so it's not necessarily amenable to scientific analysis. So let's switch to something that we know a little bit more about here. I work on the Large Hadron Collider, which is a poster child for generating big data at this point. We are recreating conditions of the early universe, and doing that, we have a flamethrower of data coming in at 100 terabytes per second. 
We only write one one hundred thousandth of that to tape, but even so, we generate 15 libraries of Congress per experiment per year, and we've had to cobble together something like a half a million computers worldwide to crunch this data. Now, this will be pushed aside by something called the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope. This will take pictures, deep pictures, of the entire universe. Their data is maybe a little bit smaller, but they're going to put all of this out and let the public access it. So that creates a number of different challenges. Perhaps the largest project work lurking on the horizon is a radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array. This thing is going to look back with ultra high resolution at the early cosmos, but it's also going to generate one exabyte of data per day. This far exceeds our current capacity to do anything with data. And so it's going to be quite a challenge to pull that off. So what good is this? If you can analyze and understand this data, you can do lots of useful things. And right now, people are doing things like looking at the spread of dengue and, and malaria, potentially getting early warnings of earthquakes. You can do real-time feedback for large systems like huge traffic jams in cities. Maybe you can reroute them. We have so many sensors deployed looking at the Earth at this point that we're getting real-time feedback, real-time diagnostics for climate modeling and predicting the future of our planet. You can study social aspects of, of data. You can do real-time predictions of inflation, econometrics. You can use cell phone data to study human mobility. And now that we have access to huge quantities of medical data, people are searching for sources of genetic and other diseases using this. This has spawned a whole new set of sciences, advanced data science or analytics, where people are trying to figure out how to wrap their arms around the huge amount of data and try to under, how, to, how we could actually process it to analyze it. We've had to develop new statistical theories because this data was not acquired in an, in an experimentally controlled way. How do you correct for those biases? And if you have disparate sets of data sets, you'd like to analyze them all together and maybe you can make new discoveries. And so people have had to develop ways of making these data sets interoperate. Here's the problem. This is a study that was published in Nature last year that showed that the amount of time that elapses from the publication of a scientific result may, and the, the probability that you can retrieve the data that went into substantiating that result, that the probability drops off dramatically as a function of time. So if we're not careful, we lose the very data that's so precious to us. So this has spawned the realization that we're spending billions of dollars producing scientific data every year. If we can't reuse that data for other science or if we lose it, then that money in some sense is wasted. Another issue that's come up recently is the, is the reproducibility of scientific results and the responsibility for individual scientists to be able to show or provide the means for people to reproduce their results. So all of these concerns have, ar have arisen new policies put forth by governments and funding agencies worldwide that can pretty much be summed up in this graphic. I want you to keep your data and make it public. So this really does raise some challenges for the scientists. So what do I mean when I say keeping science results for years? If we're just talking about the bits, you can back up your hard drive. This is relatively easy, but it needs to be automatic so that you can make sure that it's kept for a long time. The harder part is all of the other stuff that went into doing the science, the software and the knowledge. You have to have some records of what you actually did to the data in whatever form it was that you kept it. If you had some special algorithm that you used to analyze the data and derive the results in the paper, we need to know what that is. And if you ran that on a computer, we need to be able to have the computer work again to run those algorithms. So let, let me put this in a more real world example. Your dog eats your cookbook. So now your secret Thanksgiving gravy recipe is on a floppy disk. How many people know what a floppy disk is? <laughs> OK. It was written with a 1992 version of World Perfect that only runs on Windows 3.1. OK. What do you do? Unless you've preserved the capability to read a floppy disk, which might be marginal, run Windows 3.1 and a 1992 version of Word Perfect, or maybe at least you can get that disk and open the file, your turkey is going to be very dry. OK, so let's go to a little more scientific version of this. At the LHC, we have a lot of processed data, but we want to try to make scientific discoveries. In order to do that, we have to run some selections, some simplifications. Maybe we even do that again. 
and then we tend to take that data, we compare it with some simulated data, maybe there's some more inputs, and va boom, we find the Higgs boson. Okay, <laughs> now, if I gave you this plot and that data, and I didn't tell you pretty much m what we did in the, mean in the meantime, you would have no idea how to reproduce that. And so if we want to preserve the knowledge that's associated with the Higgs boson discovery, we have to preserve in some way the workflow, the algorithms, and all the other things that were run to find the Higgs boson. So now I'd, I'd like you to buy the conceit that pizza preservation is like knowledge preservation. So if you want to save a pizza, you can refrigerate it. You, you know, stick it into a short time. As long as it doesn't go moldy, you can still use it. And so you have a nice pizza, we can keep it. Now, you can do the same thing for data. You can back it up and hope. Um, now, if you want to have things last a little longer, you can take that pizza, you can put it in the freezer. So you can, until freezer burn takes over, that pizza is still good. You can do the same thing with data. You can freeze everything, the data, the computers, the operating system, and you hope, at some later time, that you can thaw it out and it will still be good. Now, if you want to save something for years and years and years, you'd like to have a recipe. And assuming that your recipe is detailed enough, you can repeat what you were doing and reproduce. Okay, so I work as part of a group called Data and Software Preservation for Open Science. This is a team of physicists, computer scientists, digital librarians, and other people, other hangers on. And <laughs> what we're trying to do is to design knowledge preservation systems for particle physicists, starting with particle physicists, and, but for other sciences as well. And so basically what we're doing is we're building automatic pizza freezers and automatic recipe generators to help us to both make this easy for scientists and useful for others. And so we're basically only one in a number of international efforts, um, but it, there is a lot of work on this worldwide. Ooh, oops. Hmm. Hope I have a backup. <laughs> this is a test of the emergency data preservation system. This is only a test. In the event of an actual data emergency, data preservers would drop from the overhead panels to save your data. Please secure your own data before helping your neighbor. This is only a test. <laughs> so now, wouldn't it be great if we had a system that knew when your hard drive was going to crash and saved your data for it. So we're not building something that's quite that sophisticated, but we're trying to build some technology that will help scientists preserve their data and preserve their knowledge for the future. And so in include, I'd like to say that the data can tsunami is already here. Can you stay afloat? Make sure you think about this. Many people are working on safety devices, but I urge you to keep a data preserver close by unless you go down with the ship. Thank you. <laughs> Is Dr. Michael Hildreth. Our second presenter for this evening, I believe, is ready in the back. So here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dr. Marcel Suarez Santos. everyone. Uh, can someone turn on the lights, please? Oh, and the heating as well. It is freezing here. Oh, no, I think something else is wrong. Oh, I bet the TARDIS is malfunctioning again. It's your fault. I am in the wrong place. I should be at Fermilab for the physics lab. And now I am, I am, hmm, where am I? Hmm. <laughs> oh well, I, according to these readings, I am at Fermilab. I'm just at the wrong time. Yes, I am four hours too late. Everybody went home. That's why it's all empty out here. 
Oh, well, why does this happen? Oh, no. Actually, I'm not four hours too late. I am 400 billion years too late. This is the end of the universe. <laughs> I should have known. This is colder than the winter in Chicago. <laughs> now, wait. How did this happen? I cannot detect a single particle, not one, in here. It's all empty. Oh, I should investigate this. Oh, well, now, what time did I end up this time? Oh, this is the early universe, just a few seconds after the Big Bang. Oh, the universe started at very, very hot early stage and it started expanding and expanding, expand, oh, expanding. Ha, huh, that is the key, the, the key. Ah, now I understand. Yes, the end of the universe is so cold and dark and bleak because of the expansion. The expansion became so dramatic at the end that all that galaxies and solar systems, everything, including these tiny little atoms, were all ripped apart. The expansion was so dramatic that nothing was left within range of detection. Yeah, that must be the solution. Now, wait. The expansion could only accelerate like that if there is some sort of energy. Some huge amount of energy must be fueling this expansion. Now, where would I hide a huge amount of energy? Aha! Uh -huh. Of course, in the empty space between the galaxies. Yes, because as the universe expands, if the energy is stored in the vacuum between the galaxies, then of course there will be more empty space, there will be more energy, and the expansion will become faster and faster and faster, and that's how it will work. Yes, absolutely. Ha, I knew it. Yes, I have to go to the physics lab and tell people about it. They will love to hear about this. It'll be fantastic. wrong again. I mean, okay, it's a little bit better. It's not 400 billion years. It's only 4 billion years too late, but it is still the wrong time. This is the sun turning into a red giant, and this is definitely not where, not when I want to be. It's where. This is clearly Fermilab, but it is definitely not the right time. I mean, why? The TARDIS is so unreliable. Why can I not travel to the time, the time that I want? I want November 21st, 2014, please. <sighs> okay, let me get out of here. This is hot and the earth is gone. This is not the right time to be here. <sighs> Aha, uh -huh. now I recognize it. This looks like the Fermilab I know. Yeah, absolutely. But, oh, not again. 2012. No, no, so close, but still not there. All right, but actually here, that is something interesting. 2012 was the year when Fermilab scientists, in collaboration with other scientists all over Earth, they finalized the construction of a large camera called the Dark Energy Camera. The camera was built to observe large areas of the sky and with that, try to understand the energy. Humans used to call that dark energy, which I think is quite a fitting name considering what I've seen in the end of the universe. Well, this camera was so fantastic. It had 62 
detectors with high sensitivity and it was built at Fermilab by the scientists here and tested and constructed and then shipped to Chile and was used to observe galaxies far, far away and thousands of explosions of, of, of stars. It was fantastic. Of course, this was before humans knew how to travel across space and time, so all they could do was learn by observing from Earth which is quite boring, I have to say, but that's what they could do. That was really fantastic. I think humans are really ingenious considering the limited resources they had at the time. Yes, DKIM was a great, great machine. Unlike some machines I know, it was actually very reliable, worked very well. Oh well, this is great. I really like 2012, but I want to get the physics slam. I have something to tell people there. Okay, now I must be at the right time. I was very careful. Oh, no, 2214. This is not, oh, almost there, right? Oh, oh, I, seriously, seriously, this is not possible. Oh, cookies, I like cookies. I should check this out. Hmm. Oh, the cookies are a little bit lame, actually. But um, never mind. What is really great is the fact that huh, humans, how clever, they actually finally measured all the properties of dark energy. They finally discovered why the expansion of the universe is accelerating and what is going on. It's really, really exciting. Oh, a small step for a time lord, a great step for humanity. This is really fantastic, it's super great. Okay, now the actual awesome part of this is that with this measurement, I now can use this information to fix the TARDIS and fix its navigation system and get to the exact time I want to be within 10 minutes. That's great. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. Let me try again, just make sure. Yeah, it works. Now I will be able to get to the physics lab. Or not. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to finally meet you. You have no idea how difficult it was to get here today. It is fantastic. So I am really happy to report today about dark energy. You will learn a lot because I've been to the future and I've seen what was happening there. Yeah. Okay, I am running out of time, no panic, no panic. I'm a time lord, running out of time is something I do a lot. So, <laughs> before they kick me out, let me say something. Pay attention to what Fermilab is doing. Fermilab is going to unveil the mysteries of dark energy. They are going to measure that in detail and have all the explanations that you need. Just pay attention to them, wait a little bit, you get there. All right, I have to go. That was Dr. Marcel Soares Santos. And now our third presentation for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dr. Joseph Zanamo. Hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> oh. All right. I am very excited to be here today to explain to you the weird and wonderful world of neutrinos. Now, you might wonder why there's a picture of a sun on my slide, and that's because uh, that's because they gave me the wrong clicker. <laughs> All right, 
as I was saying, you might wonder why there's a sun on my title slide when I'm here to talk to you about neutrinos. Now, neutrinos come from the sun. As we all might know, the sun is powered by nuclear fusion. So what ends up happening is protons are swimming around in this hot, dense medium of the sun, and they get slammed together. They fuse together, and one of the byproducts of that is a neutrino. Now, as we know, the sun's giant, it's hot, it's constantly radiating, so it's not just one of these every now and then, they come down constantly. If you were to hold out your hand right now, go ahead, hold out your hand. If you look at it, it through the palm of your hand, every second, 2 times 10 to the 12 neutrinos pass, okay? To give you a sense of how big that really is, that's six times all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy passing through your hand. Another way of thinking about it is that's 19 times all the people that have ever lived passing through your hand. Now you might wonder, if these things are constantly passing through my hand and in such huge quantities, why don't I see them? Why don't I feel them? That's because they don't like to interact, okay? <laughs> they don't. In fact, to keep the hand analogy going, everybody raise your hand. Go ahead. If we start over here and we pass the neutrino through your hand and your hand and your hand all the way down, and then all the way back, and then all the way through the entire auditorium, it wouldn't interact. In fact, yeah. In fact, it wouldn't pass through 10 quintillion people's hands, okay? To give you a sense of how big that number is, there's 7 billion people alive today, right? Now you have to tack on an additional seven zeros to correspond to the number of hands that that neutrino would pass through. So you might wonder, so what? You know, these things are really weak, they don't interact a lot. Well, every now and then they do. And to do that, here at Fermilab, we build giant detectors. This is a picture of the MINOS detector. It's one of the neutrino detectors here at Fermilab. And to detect the neutrinos, we build giant slabs of steel, really, really dense material that we then line up, and every now and then a neutrino will slam into that steel and create a characteristic deposit of energy, which we then can study. So you might wonder, okay, fine, that sounds cool. So what are neutrinos? Now, everybody knows matter is made up out of electrons and protons and neutrons. What you might not know is electrons have a very small, electrically neutral cousin called the neutrino. In this case, this is an electron neutrino. Now, when I say they're small, they're really small. So if this is the size of an electron, this is the size of a neutrino. Now, you might think, you know, the guy can't even get the pointer to work right. His slides are all messed up. He must have just left the neutrino off. I didn't. I did this one right. It's just really small. And in fact, right here is the neutrino. It makes up one pixel on this entire screen compared to this electron, okay? And just to make the picture a lot harder to understand, there's a bunch of them, <laughs> all right? So the electron has a heavier cousin called the muon, and that has an even heavier cousin called the tau. And all three of these have neutrinos associated with them. So you might wonder, okay, fine, cool. But why are they useful? What, what, what does this do for me? So one thing, right, just like when you hold your hand up and the neutrinos go flying through, you can do similar things with astronomy, okay? So if we look at this picture, this is a picture of a giant dust cloud floating out in the galaxy, right? If we're using a typical telescope, we look for light. And out here you can see nice, bright, shiny stars and everything like that, which is great. But in here you notice that with the dust cloud in the way, the stars get obscured. They're harder to see. Now, scientists at the South Pole had this great idea, and they took the glacier, which makes up the South Pole, and they ran photon detectors in them so they could look for light. And basically what they do is they look up at the night sky, and they wait for neutrinos to come in and interact in the light and deposit huge amounts of energy. And when I mean huge, I mean these deposits of energy are the size of the Golden Gate Bridge. These are the events that they reconstruct. And what they do is, looking at the night sky, they look to see where these neutrinos come from. And with the hope that in time, we'll be able to actually map out what the night sky looks like in neutrinos and instead of light, in much the same way we do with light. So that's cool. What else can we do with neutrinos? Communication. Now, right now, if you make a phone call, right, let's say we're calling from New York to Africa, we have to then beam that information up into space so that it, inter uh, that it hits a satellite. 
Then that satellite has to beam that information to another satellite before that information gets beamed back down to Africa where someone answers the phone. Now that's nice, but isn't there a better way? Can't we just make a straight line from New York to Africa? And with neutrinos, you would be able to. You'd be able to shoot it right through the Earth. So the Minerva collaboration here at Fermilab has done something much similar to that. They used a neutrino beam to encode a message. This message actually reads neutrino, if you, uh, if you could read whatever this is. <laughs> and what they were able to do was then, on the other end, sitting th through uh, kilometers of dirt, were able to actually reconstruct what the message said. And you can see it's a bit broken up and it's a bit garbled, right? But with specially designed detectors and specially designed beams, one can imagine being able to do this in a much more efficient way. All right? Also, nifty. OK, what else do you got? So nonproliferation. It's a horrible word. Never say it. Basically, what it means is we want to keep countries that aren't supposed to have nuclear weapons from having nuclear weapons. So how can we do this? One idea is to take very, very large ships, so super tankers, and hang from the bottom from them giant neutrino detectors filled with water and let them float out in international waters some distance away from the country that has the nuclear weapons that you don't want to have nuclear weapons. And then if you have enough of them, what you'd ever be, actually be able to do is trace back to the point where these neutrinos were coming from because nuclear reactors, much like the sun, are prolific sources of neutrinos. Okay? So the SNF collaboration has actually started looking into doing this, creating an entire array of super tankers with neutrino detectors attached to the bottom of them, and let them float all around the oceans, all over the world, and create a map of the neutrinos coming from these nuclear reactors. OK? But that's not why I like neutrinos. I like neutrinos for science. And here at Fermilab, we are one of the premier places in the world to study neutrinos. To do this, we take a beam of protons, we circle it around our accelerators, and we smash that into very dense targets. And what this does is it creates a large stream of neutrinos, which just pass right through the Earth. And what we look for is something called neutrino oscillations. And remember earlier when I was talking about how there's different flavors of neutrinos, neutrinos get even goofier. What ends up happening is if you create a beam of neutrinos that are mostly t uh, muon neutrinos, as they travel through the Earth, they start to change. Slowly, they'll start becoming tau neutrinos, and then all of them become tau neutrinos, and then they start changing back. What does this tell us? Well, what we hope to do here at Fermilab is to study these neutrino oscillations and to help us gain insight into why, during the Big Bang, when matter and antimatter were crea uh, created in equal quantities, nowadays, there's only matter, OK? And looking at these neutrino oscillations, that'll be able to give us some insight into what's going on. So I hope I've convinced you that neutrinos are a bit weird, but all wonderful. Thank you. That was Dr. Joseph Zanamo. And now our fourth presenter for the evening Getting ready to come on stage, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Wes Ketchum. Thank you. Okay, so I have a long one, so we gotta move fast. Um, luckily, Joseph already talked a lot about neutrinos. I wanna talk about how we actually try to take a picture of neutrino, how we actually try to detect them. So Joseph already told you that neutrinos don't like to interact, that they're essentially very invisible. And they're not just kind of invisible-ish. They're like really, really, really almost invisible, okay? So you might wonder then, how do we detect them? What can we try to do to detect them? Well, you can try to do two things. One, you want really big detectors. You want to get a lot of material for the neutrino to interact with. And so if it's, you know, it doesn't do it so often, but you have a lot of stuff there, maybe you'll see something every once in a while. That's what you see here. This is the Super Kamiokande Neutrino Observatory in Japan. It's about as tall as the Statue of Liberty and about as wide, too. And it's filled with 50,000 tons of water. Okay? The other thing that you can try to do is make lots of neutrinos, which Joseph already s said, that's what we do here at Fermilab. So you're here in Ramsey Auditorium. Um, we make a bunch of neutrinos over here. Uh, it's about 10 trillion neutrinos per second when we're really running. That's a huge number. And then we put some neutrino detectors about half a mile from that source, and we see what we can get. <laughs> yeah, don't just wander around the lab. It's dangerous, all right? OK, so that's 
that's what we want to try to do. So how do we actually really detect them? Well, you, you want to really try to look at what they produce when they interact and use that information to tell you more about the neutrinos themselves. And to do that, you have a few different ways that you can try to you know, see what they produce when they interact. Uh, Cherenkop radiation, so if you have a particle go very, very fast through water or oil or ice, it can emit a certain uh, pattern of light and a, a wavelength of light that you can then trace back to say more about what that particle was and so what that neutrino made. Uh, similarly, scintillation, there are certain types of materials that when they're hit by uh, high energy particles or like ultraviolet light, that they'll kind of glow and emit some light and you can re detect that light and see where particles went. But the thing I'm most interested in, the one I really enjoy, is ionization. In particular, I work on an experiment that uses a liquid argon time projection chamber. It's a lot of words, let's go through it slowly. Liquid, everyone knows what liquid is? Yes, yeah? Uh, somebody give me an example of a liquid. Yeah, right, cats, yes, okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, everyone knows what argon is? Maybe you don't know what argon is. Okay, so here's a periodic table, there's argon, right? Um, argon is actually in air, it's the third most abundant element in air, about 1%. Um, liquid argon is then liquid air. It's cold, right? Really, really cold, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, there's a lot of reasons we might want to use argon. I won't go into all of them here. The real reason I like using argon, they're just so gosh darn cute. <laughs> okay, so this is actually the experiment that I work on, microboon. This thing, this is our cryostat. It's about uh, the size of a school bus or so. Um, it's being lowered into its uh, building uh, on that uh, neutrino beamline that I told you about before. It holds about 60,000 gallons of liquid argon. That's amazing. It's been welded shut. We're never gonna go into it again. Um, luckily for you, I have a sneak peek with the first ever world premiere claymation animation of what's going on inside the liquid argon TPC. All right, are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> ah! Look at that move around. Yeah. All right. That took me two hours. <laughs> OK. Time projection chamber. Everyone knows what time projection chamber is, right? Probably not. OK, so let's, uh, let's go through that. So actually, what's inside of that big round cry set is this big rectangle thing. And what's inside that big rectangle thing is not people anymore, thank goodness. <laughs> Um, on one side, we have a bunch of wires. There's 8,000 wires and they're three millimeters apart, okay? And so what happens is when, say, an electron goes by those wires, it leaves a little signal on the wires that we have some electronics that we can use to read out. On the other side, you see this big, big metal sheet here, this, this solid metal sheet. And that's important because we put a lot of negative charge on that sheet. So again, here we go, more claymation. Uh, there's a lot of negative charge there on that sheet. And what happens is sometimes, we can, if we were to somehow create a bunch of little electrons, a cute little drifting electron right there, um, they don't like that lots of charge there. They want to run away from it. It's kind of like they're running away from, say, I don't know, a dragon. Dragon, dragon, there we go. Um, the killer rabbit from Monty Python. A seductive looking Joseph. Or a scary combination of all three. All right? So they, they bolt, they just wanna get away from that thing and they come down away from that sheet towards our wires, okay? And that's, that's how we see you know, where those electrons are made. So now you can wonder, well, let's, a little bit about those drifting first. They actually go pretty fast. They go 6,000 miles per hour and they all move at the same speed. So whatever, whatever pattern that they were made to begin with, that's what they get to, um, that's the same pattern that they have while they're drifting. Um, 6,000 miles per hour, that sounds like a lot. Um, for physicists, we deal with the speed of light a lot, and that's actually a lot slower than the speed of light um, to maybe kind of give some estimate. Um, it's kind of like Usain Bolt and a tortoise, that's the difference there. <laughs> so, so for a lot of us, this is like new and slow. Um, but it's still really interesting, I'll tell you why. So let's say a neutrino happens to go through our detector, interact with an argon, and it makes a cute little charged particle, say like this adorable looking pion. What happens? Well, that pion comes through, and when it gets close enough, if it's energetic enough to an argon atom, it'll kind of rip an electron off of that argon atom, okay? That's what's called ionization. And then what happens? They drift. And you'll note, they all drift in that same line, tracing where that pion came from, right? So we can use that, and if we look at the data of the electrical signals that we get back out, this is actually what one of those data events looks like. Here was a neutrino interaction in the Argonut TPC, which is kind of a smaller version of Microboon, 
and here's where a charged particle came through, all in a nice line. So that's how, that's how we see what's going on. Now, there's more. So, and you can actually tell the difference between different kinds of particles, say a muon, which Joseph talked about before, and a proton, which is bigger and heavier. What happens? Well, say you have a neutrino come in, produces a muon, also knocks a proton out of the nucleus. That proton, when it travels through, since it's bigger and heavier and just meaner looking, uh, ionizes more. Whoops. Let's try that again. It ionizes more of the argon as it goes through. But because it's losing more energy as it's going, it tends to stop and not go as far as, say, the muon does. So while the proton just kind of meh, meh, there we go, <laughs> dies out, the muon keeps going. And then all the electrons drift down. And so what that ends up looking like when you're looking at the event is something like this. Here is the, actually you see two proton tracks, what looks to be like two proton tracks and a muon or a charged pion. Okay, there's more. <laughs> uh, different energies of muons can interact differently. Say a high energy muon, it'll just kind of like zip on through. We're speeding up now, we gotta go faster. Uh, it'll go through, it's just kind of in a straight line and all the electrons will drift down. We already saw something like that before. But if it's a lower energy muon, it'll kind of bounce around a little bit as it goes. And so if you look for those differences in how straight the track of the muon was, you can say something about how much energy that that muon had, okay? You can do cool things too, like look for when you have a particle decay into another particle. Say a charged pion comes in, um, gets in your detector somewhere and changes into a muon. And then again, you see a little kink in the track there from where that de uh, decay happened. Now, what's very important is that you have really, really pure liquid argon. Because if you have anything that has oxygen in it, like oxygen molecules or water, those guys love electrons. So you'll be just drifting your electrons, they all look very nice and happy, and all of a sudden your oxygen comes along and, oh, the humanity! <laughs> Let's watch that again. I love this one so much. Okay, but uh, as Joseph was talking about before, that what, one thing that we really want to look for is neutrino oscillation. So most of the neutrinos that we make are of the muon variety, and so they tend to make muons when they interact in our detector. But occasionally you might have one an elect that turns into an electron-flavored neutrino, and that instead will make an electron in the detector, and that's when things get a little weird. So you'll have an electron come in, and instead of going in a kind of a straight line, it tends to radiate and give off a photon. And that photon, as it goes, can actually turn into an electron and an anti-electron. And so you just get this stream of particles go through where you have electrons radiating and photons turning into more electrons and anti-electrons. It's what we call an electromagnetic shower. You just get this huge bundle of particles that go through. And it actually makes really beautiful looking images like this where you have the beginning, beginning of an electron, possibly an electron starting, and where then you see all of this sort of pair production and radiation happen. So this is what we really want to see in our detector. We're looking for things like this. So the main point, take home message, particles that we take pictures of in the end, all these cute adorable little guys, tell us about the neutrino that made them, which in turn tells us more about how our universe works. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Wes Ketchum. Our final presenter for this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I think ready to roll back there. Everyone, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Uh, oh my gosh, doc, I got you right now. You ready, Dr. Okay, I got you, I got you. I just want to make sure you're ready. Everyone, Dr. Vic Gaiman. This is my talk. I, I hope you like it. So we're going to start with the Big Bang because you've got to start somewhere. The Big Bang injected an unimaginable amount of energy into all of space simultaneously. And as it cooled off, that plasma of soon-to-be stuff, some of it turned into protons and neutrons. And as they cooled off, they in, turn, they in turn became the nuclei that make up the light elements that we see today. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. But as these guys are trying to claw their way up the mass ladder, they discover that that, mat, that ladder is missing a couple of rungs. It turns out that there's no stable nuclei with a, math, with a mass of either five or eight. So to jump over that gap, they need to get some energy from someplace. Now it turns out there's a convenient way to do that. You make stars. 
Stars condense out of clouds of mostly hydrogen, and if they get hot enough, they start turning hydrogen into helium. You get a little bit of energy every time you do that. And if they're heavier, that helium starts to turn into carbon and oxygen and all sorts of other things. And really heavy ones end up with an incompressible core of iron at the very center. Now it turns out that this even runs out of gas eventually too. Because as you fuse heavier and heavier things together, you get a little bit less energy out each time. And that means that you, have, you end up getting stuck down here at this hole in the bottom with iron 56, the most tightly bound nucleus there is. But we see lots of things heavier than that in the world around us. We know somehow we've got to climb up that hill, but you need a lot of energy to do that, so what's going to take? Well, turns out you get that energy by blowing the star apart. As stars shine, they lose a little bit of energy all the time, and they compensate for that by getting a little bit denser and a little bit hotter. And as that heat and pressure starts to build up, all of a sudden that incompressible iron core doesn't start to seem so incompressible anymore. And like anything else, if you put too much pressure on it, it eventually just gives up. And it collapses into an even more dense and, inco and, and incompressible ball of neutrons. And what happens is, all of that material that was piled up against the iron core, all of a sudden, like Wiley e. Coyote, realizes it's not standing on anything and it falls inward. When it hits that iron core, it bounces because it's really hard and, it goes and all that material goes flying out into the outer parts of the star. When that happens, the, the bounced material uh, f goes flying out into the outer parts and it collides with the infall and turns into this hot, dense, swirling nuclear soup. And that has all of the energy that we need to make all the heavy elements we see now. And for a few brief moments, that dying star shines brighter than the entire galaxy it was in. But it turns out that's not the end of the story. Because when a, dense, when a heavy star like that blows up, it enriches all of the material around it with lots of heavy elements. And that can in turn collapse back into another star. And that's where we are, that's where we come in. Everything that you've ever made, everything you've ever encountered other than hydrogen, was born in the same supermassive star that burned and shined and died and then blew itself apart right about where we are now. So all of the gold and silver and mercury and lead, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your blood, the carbon in your DNA, all of the silicon and rare earths and every gadget you have in your pocket, all of that stuff was born in this same massive star. We're connected by this shared ancestry. Everything and everyone you've ever encountered is your brother and sister, born in that same star and then reborn and recondensed out of its ashes. How can we possibly imagine studying this? It happened billions of years ago. Well, we are faced with this problem very often in science. We look for similar things that happen now. We try to figure out what the differences are. We sort of patch up all the details. And it turns out we see supernova explosions all the time, you know, a couple a week. We see them in telescopes, though, and that tells us about light, but it doesn't tell us about anything else that the, that the supernova gives off. It turns out if you can see neutrinos, Neutrinos carry up away about 99% of the energy released in a supernova explosion. The other thing is that depending on what part of the explosion is going on, the number of neutrinos and the energy they have changes as a function of what nuclear reactions are going on. So if you can actually see the neutrinos, this tells you about all sorts of information about what's actually going on inside of the supernova. What's more, light can get stopped by what, anything between you and whatever it was that emitted it. Whereas neutrinos, as we've heard several times tonight, just goes flying straight through. If you can see neutrinos, it allows you to see straight into the heart of whatever's going on in that exploding star. Now we're getting ready to build a very large, liquid, a very large neutrino detector that's going to be filled with liquefied argon. The goal is to detect neutrinos that are born right here at Fermilab. And, to, and, it, and, the, and the plan is to try to answer questions like, why is the universe made of matter and not antimatter or anything at all? And to do that, we need to go about 800 miles away to the Black Hills of South Dakota. It's right near Deadwood and Sturgis and Mount Rushmore and a few other things you've probably heard of. The other thing about the Black Hills is that people have been mining gold there for about 150 years. And that means there's lots of nice deep holes in the ground that we can use as laboratories. That's really good because the signal you expect from supernovas is very faint. And on the surface of the Earth, there are lots of backgrounds, radiation, cosmic rays, all sorts of things that just scream much louder than that very faint supernova signal we're trying to see. And as you go deeper underground, your background gets lower and lower. The other thing that you end up with is that when a supernova happens nearby, 
you get more events from it because as the supernova, you know, as the, as the neutrinos spread out through space, they get more and more diffuse because they have to spread out through more and more area. So if the supernova happens close, you get lots of events. If it happens farther away, you get many fewer. If the supernova is on the surface, you can just see the nearest star that in astronomical time scales, like a million years or so, is probably going to go supernova soon. If you go just 1,000 feet underground, you cover the entire Milky Way galaxy. And at 5,000 feet underground, you can actually get not just the Milky Way, but all of its satellite galaxies, and almost out to Andromeda from that. This has happened before, actually. In 1987, I was in the fourth grade. A, super, uh, a massive star in the Large Magellanic Cloud exploded. And in two detectors spread on, diff on different sides of the planet Earth, one was in Japan and the other one was in Ohio, we saw about 20 events. And those 20 events have been enough to, to write literally thousands of academic papers about. And I want everybody to sort of think about for a little bit, with 20 events, we got all this work. How much better could we do with the bigger, better, smarter detectors that we're getting ready to build now or that we've already built since then? And this, after all, is the reason we do science in the first place. It's not for prizes and accolades and medicine and missiles and gadgets and gizmos and tools and trucks and all sorts of things like that. Those are great. But those are, those are the effects of science. They're not the cause. The cause of science is because we're part of the universe and the universe is part of us. And this is how the cosmos comes to know itself. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Vic Gaiman. Okay. So those are the five presenters for this evening. Uh, just can I have one quick more, you know, one round of applause one more time for all five of them. All right, before I call them all out, we're going to work a little bit on the process here. Um, Dave over here is going to set up our sound monitor so we have an idea of the actual loudness that we actually can uh, create in the auditorium will let us know, you know, who actually wins this. But as he's getting set up, I do, uh, I, I would be, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't actually thank a couple people for allowing us to put this on for the third year in a row. You know, not, it's not often that you would be able to, like I said, come on down on a Friday night and hear about physics in a, in a humorous way and, uh, you know, elicit uh, applause and laughter as we, as all of them got this evening. And the person that is, that can, we can thank the most for that is the director of Fermilab. But I'm assuming that the director of the Fermilab is generally always thanked first and his wife is thanked second. So tonight I'm going to go, I'm going to be different. I don't, I don't work here. So I want to, uh, I want to uh, thank, and we're going to uh, you know, say hi to both of them. So can we, uh, can I just get a round of applause for, for uh, Ellen Lockyer? She's here tonight. Where is she? Ellen? Right over there. Right back there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll also then thank the director of Fermilab, Dr. Nigel Lockyer. So out of the two of them, who won? The second one? <laughs> it's fixed. That is actually how it's going to work tonight, but thank both of you very much for coming out tonight and supporting us for the third time and for allowing us to put this on. So we're going to call each one of them out. I'm going to call them out one at a time so you can just get an idea of who they are. So participate or, you know, presenters get ready. We're going to come out just one at a time. Let's start first of all. We're not going to do the applause. We're going to bring them all out first, then we're going to applaud again. So first of all, Michael Hildreth. Second, Mar Marcel Suarez Santos. Third, Joseph Zanamo. <laughs> Fourth, Wes Ketchum. And our fifth presenter, the Gaiman.
All right, so now what's going to happen is I will I'll point, I'll just go in this order as we did before. I'll call the first participant. You just applaud. I'm going to give you five seconds when I, when I put my hand down like this. <laughs> you, know, that's, you guys can test that, I'm sure, of like <clears throat> speed of something. But anyway, when I come down, that's what you'll stop your applause. All right, so we're going to try just one time. I'm not going to go five seconds, just go by the thing. So here we go. And applaud. It's not bad. We're not going to do it more than once. You get it. Okay. When I come down, try to stop right then, and then we'll go on to the first. We'll go on then. Oh, so yes, and I'll move out of the way. You're not, you're not, you don't like this? All right, we'll start this out. All right, so here we go. Are you ready, sir? Okay. Our first presenter of the evening, Dr. Michael Hildreth. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's like my... I don't know what we're going by. We're going by the max. 98.9. All right. Our second presenter for this evening, Dr. Marcel Soares Santos. Okay. Our third presenter for the evening, Dr. Joseph Zanamo. Bad. Our fourth presenter for the evening, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wes Ketchum. <laughs> All right. And our fifth presentation for the evening, Dr. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Don Doctor. Doctor. <laughs> Doctor Vic Gaiman. Results were, ladies and gentlemen, the third annual 2014 <laughs> Physics Slam here at Fermi Lab. Ladies and gentlemen, on November 21st, 2014, please congratulate Dr. Wes Ketchum. Yeah. Please welcome Round to the two. stage the director of Fermi Lab, as he knows what he's doing, Dr. Nigel Lockyer. <laughs> sure. Yes. He, well, oh, yes. This is more complicated than it looks. <laughs> You just give it to the winner, and I'll give it to the rest of them. Oh, you will? Yeah, why not? Well, no, no, I guess I won't, sir. I, I'll just hand it to All right, Joseph. Nice work. <laughs> Marcella. She's <laughs> the only lady on stage. Come on, man. Michael. Victor. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. How are you doing? <laughs> All right, let's see who won. Uh... <laughs> Wes, nice job. <laughs> we, we, we seem to have. Yeah, what did you get, Wes? Oh, I got a book. <laughs> the Amazing Story of Quantum Mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your car's outside. They can see the answer down here, by the way. They know what they're getting. All right, we have one, one more contestant. Chris Miller, yay! Yeah! Right now, what we're going to be doing, though, is we, uh, since you have a unique opportunity and we have a few minutes, um, we do open this up now for a question and answer that uh, can come from you out there that you might want to ask uh, 
a probing question to any one of the five about their presentations an question. or things that you want to know just in general about physics. We'll do this just for a few moments, a few minutes, just to open up to you. So we'll, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question that you want to ask one of the scientists, uh, please state your name and, uh, and then just direct your question to the front. So, sir, please. I'm Andy. I'd like to know if the claymation was done during business hours. <laughs> No. <laughs> you have to get the right amount of coffee at 1 a.m. to stay awake, but you can't have your hands wiggle too much. It's a disaster. Sir, over there. Hello, I'm Vijay. Uh, I have a simple question. You said, everybody said, kind of three of you, there are trillions of neutrinos going through your hand, but you cannot detect anything. How you are sure there are trillion uh, neutron, neutrinos? So how you are sure you cannot detect uh, a single one, like very dif with difficulty, and you are saying, how you claim that? That's the question. So this is a lovely example of one of those times in nature where a very small number, like the cross section for neutrinos interaction, when you multiply it by a very big number, like the mass of super K, uh, you actually get a sort of finite number of neutrinos that you can count very nicely. Now you have to compare things very carefully between calculations and, and data and things like that to make sure that you've fixed up all of the details and gotten that right, but that's, that's how we do it. You, do, you have to do it with a really big detector. And so the, prob the probability of detecting any individual neutrino is fantastically small. But when you have enough of them and you have enough of a sufficiently big detector, then you, know, then you can do it. Thank you. Over here. So, are there any thing? Are there any? So, the things that touch the neutrons and creates electrons. Are there any things that, when they touch the neutrons, they create multiple electrons? <laughs> yeah, like more than one. Do, do, do you want to get this one, Wes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, so one of, one of the things that can happen actually is that if you create a, if instead of a neutrino creating an electron, if you have a neutrino that interacts with the nucleus and makes a photon, you don't really see the ionization from that photon, but that photon, like we, we hopefully showed, will um, turn into an electron and an anti-electron. So that kind of looks like it's creating two, um, which is actually, and that's a problem. Those are actually a background for us looking for the electron ones. So. The other thing that you find is that when, when the, amount of energy released in an interaction is large enough, pretty much anything that you can make eventually does get made. So yeah, if you have enough energy pumped into the system, sure, you can make two electrons sometimes. The probability of making an electron plus something else, that's often a little bit higher. But yeah, sure, you can make two electrons. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlie Zimmer, and I was uh, wondering, this might be kind of out there, but if uh, with neutrinos since they don't get stopped like light and light gets stopped by uh, certain things. So is there a chance that this neutri neutrino research could go far enough where you could actually uh, detect kind of into what's going on inside a black hole and a little bit farther inside that? So bla black holes are hard because black holes, uh, basically nothing, light itself can't leave. And it's just a property of the space time which surrounds the black hole. So black holes are difficult. Other things you can probe inside of. I mean, as we heard earlier, you can look inside of what's going on inside of a supernova because the neutrinos will pass right through it. Or the sun. Well, yeah, that was actually yeah, yeah, good, good idea. The sun as well. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can actually see the different layers, right? Because most, when you look at the sun, what you end up seeing is just the top layer because that's where all the light lasts last scatters, whereas a neutrino that's born inside the very heart of, the, st of the, the sun can actually propagate all the way through outside and you'd be able to look at what's going on inside of it. So a black hole, probably not. Lots of other things though, yes, definitely. Well, there is one way you could look if, if you have a black hole paired with another star, something like a neutron star, for instance, and uh, it, they are close enough that uh, the black hole starts actually tearing material apart and disrupting the neutron star and they are close to merging, then you have a burst of neutrinos that you could uh, hopefully detect if mm -hmm. it happens close enough, right? Um, so with these detectors these guys are building, they would see, um, they would see some if uh, it would happen in, uh, within our galaxy. 
and uh, that would be cool. We would learn a lot about the, the black holes and the physics in that, that scale. Thank you. We have a question over here. <coughs> uh, hello, my name is Nate, <laughs> and my Hi, question Nate. goes to Mr. Wes. Um, first, it's a two-parter. First question, <laughs> where did you attend college? And the second question, how long did it take you to research such fine, fine detail in your presentation today? <laughs> So first, first oh, sorry. Dr. West. So I went to the University of Oklahoma for undergraduate, and I went to the University of Chicago for graduate school. Um, and I already forgot your second question. <laughs> uh, he shouted again real fast. How long did it take you to do the research for the presentation? Oh, I'm still doing it. It's not done. <laughs> I, I mean, I've been oh, studying. Oh, I've been studying physics for. Uh, I mean, for about 10 years or so now. So it's. Wow. Uh, I mean, so there's a lot of you know all the different pieces that you pull together kind of all lead to this. But and I'm still learning more. I still have a lot to learn. And and Dr. West, how long did it actually take you to do the claymation on the presentation? <laughs> Um, I mean, in, in total, in total, getting all the materi material for this talk, it was probably around 20 to 25 hours. <laughs> and he got a book, but he got a book. I got a book. You got yeah, a book. That's right. Way in the back, sir. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, my name's Wayne Kankowski. Um, what is the uh, oscillatory period of the neutrino transition? Is that a fundamental constant, or does that vary under different conditions? So, <laughs> I didn't say oscillation. Anyone can answer. Go right I, ahead. I, I can take this one. So the actual, uh, the frequency of the oscillation is actually kind of set by, remember how I had the three different neutrinos on the board? The difference in mass between those is set. But what ends up happening is it's also driven by the energy of the neutrinos and the distance over which they travel. So while the mass is set, right, the difference between the two masses is set, you can tune your energy of your neutrino beam and where you look for the neutrinos to select out specific parts of that oscillatory nature. All right. Over here, sir. Okay. Is it possible that uh, dark matter could be made out of neutrinos? That is an awesome question. <laughs> I it is very difficult to make, uh, well, it is difficult to, like, to use neutrinos as explanation for dark matter because it is difficult to make that work well with what we know about the history of formation of structures. So structures, by structures I mean galaxies and clusters of galaxies. We have a pretty good understanding from those observations that we do, for instance, with DCAM. Uh, we have a very good understanding of how the, um, or the sequence in, uh, in the history of the universe of formation of structures. Everything starts very smooth and very uh, hot and dense in the early universe, and it gets clumpier and clumpier and further apart and bigger and bigger structures form. That scenario with, if you put neutrinos as dark matter and calculate it through, that scenario doesn't hold. So unless if you do some um, theoretical gymnastics, and uh, 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 I would never underestimate the ability of the, the, the theorists to actually come up with clever <laughs> ideas, um, it is difficult, but it is um, in principle possible. So that said, if you actually run the numbers on this, it turns out that the total mass of the universe in neutrinos is actually really close to the total mass of the universe that exists in stars. So while stars are a very small component of the universe, but so are neutrinos, but they're both important. And while you, that, you, know, it, while you can't make all of the dark matter in the universe neutrinos just because it messes up all of the structure formation that we see, but a very tiny component, a very tiny, tiny component. If you, if you mean, if by you mean dark matter, you mean things that don't emit light and have some mass, then yeah, it's a very tiny component of it, but it's not the major one. Hey, sir, a uh, young man, how old are you, by the way? Eight. Eight. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Good question. 
before I take that question, I promise I'm going to do whatever I can to be doing this until you're here, and then that's my last year. <laughs> my last year. You just, I'll make, I'll write your name down. I'm going to find you, and then we're going to get you up here. We're going to take two more questions. Two more questions right back there in the back. My question is that uh, scientific law states that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So where did the stuff come from for the Big Bang to happen? <laughs> do, you, do you want to get this one or do you want me to? <laughs> I'll, I'll, you, I'll let you jump on this grenade. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the courtesy. <laughs> okay, so um, the story there is that at the very early universe, the amount of energy that you have there gets preserved across the history of the universe and it's changing in uh, form or shape, right? Except uh, for dark energy, which seems to be the remaining mystery there. So the idea there is uh, the concept, actually, of the Big Bang is, I think it's the, it's the other way around. We are not asking that much about where the energy to promote the Big Bang came from, but what we do is, from what we know today and looking back in time and reconstructing the history of the universe back in time, we know that there was at that singularity point, time equals zero, where uh, all the energy and all the, the matter energy of the universe was concentrated in one infinitely uh, small uh, point. And, uh, and that uh, later becomes what the universe is today. So the way I like to think about this, and it's, and it's easy to sort of imagine the Big Bang as something that happened like right here in some point in space. But that's the, pro the problem is that it wasn't that the Big Bang happened in some individual point in space. Space was just really small and it happened everywhere. And so it's not so much a question as something that happened that you needed to light a fuse and get it started. It's all of, the, all of the matter and energy, all of the energy in the universe was there already and it was just compacted down into something very small. And then for some reason, we still don't really understand because physics sort of breaks when you get down to that kind of, yeah. uh, that kind of a small scale. Then that just, it, it just sort of, ex it went through some phase transition and then yeah. exploded out so into what we see one now. One thing we know is, like, uh, is that in nature, um, natural processes will tend to go from simple to complex configuration. That's uh, uh, the basic concept behind the idea of entropy. That uh, if you leave a natural system, your universe, if you want, evolve naturally, the idea is that the configurations that are more complex are more likely than the simple configurations. It's something like, it's always easy to imagine that your room that starts all tidy and nicely well done, <laughs> et cetera, gets all messed up, et cetera, you don't even know how, but you couldn't imagine that it would naturally go back into the state would be tied unless somebody put some effort on it. Um, so uh, from that principle, the idea is whatever mechanisms that would put all the energy of the universe into a state that is so simple as to be concentrated in one single point, right, where all the energy is concentrated there, the natural thing to happen is for it to expand and to get more complex and evolve in time in the direction that we are observing. Wow. This will be our last question. Before we take the last question, just uh, know that all five of these presenters will be uh, in the back later at the, at the reception and we invite you to the reception to ask them questions face to face, talk to them if you wish for a little while and uh, enjoy uh, some, uh, some fellowship with one another. So we'll take one last question and then we'll uh, conclude this year's physics plan. Right over here. Um, so Wes, you said... That's Dr. Wes. <laughs> That's Dr. Wes, <laughs> sorry. Dr. Wes, you said um, that um, when an uh, electron neutrino came in, it made an electron and an electron, um, and weird things started to happen. But you didn't say what happened when a tau neutrino came. What happens there? Yeah, luckily we don't have to deal with that very much, so. Um, but no, I, the, if, it, if it's a tau neutrino, um, if, it, if it has enough energy, then it can, it can create a, a tau. Um, and that's actually not been observed very, very often. It has been seen 
Um, but you have to uh, three now, I think. Yeah, <laughs> three. <laughs> um, but uh, a, and a tau is kind of weird. A tau, a, uh, a tau is kind of like a so a muon is kind of like a heavy electron, and a tau is like a heavy, heavy electron. And it will kind of it will it will end up decaying very quickly, and so then you'll see all of the decay products. It's actually it's pretty cool. Excellent. One last time, applause for these five people. We thank you very much for coming to this year's Physics Slam. We hope to see you in 2015 at our fourth annual. Have a great evening and drive safely. Be warm out there, Chicago.